All right, while everybody's finding their seat, I'll run over a couple of announcements. Uh, we put out a prayer request yesterday because there was a, uh, we found out that Selena got tested again for the COVID virus, even though she's feeling better, but she still tested positive, whatever that means. I mean, we have people who test positive and test negative and, you know, the false positives and false negatives. But um, anyway, just continue to pray for her and her recovery and her husband and her sons. And then the other announcement is that this week, starting yesterday all through Friday, the, uh, uh, there will be an online teen webinar for uh, Camp Arete. Uh, today it was uh, David Roseland, pastor of, of um, Preston City Bible Church. And then tomorrow, Clay Ward, who's pastor of Tullahoma Bible Church, and uh, he'll be speaking. They've got, uh, he's at two and at four, and there's some other speakers in there. Wednesday, it's um, uh, Jeff Phipps speaking. On Thursday, it's going to be uh, Charlie Clough. And then on Friday, it will be Brad, uh, Brad Mastin. And um, I'll just report that last night we had a, a board meeting for the Chafer Seminary, and the seminary is doing well. And I'm ple very pleased because we have. Um, I think we have 10 or 11 on the board, and I am so pleased because about half the board or a little more are younger men, and for so long we were, you know, we're ch challenged that area, and it's not just that we've got some younger men, but they're really taking ownership and responsibility, coming up with really good ideas and, and everything, and uh, it just tightening everything up and uh, bringing things into a, a, a much more professional uh, graduate school orientation. A lot of people forget that that's what a seminary is. This is a Bible college is undergraduate. A, a seminary is graduate. Now, one thing y'all ought to be prepared for, think about this. Next January, after I get back from Kiev, I will be teaching the first semester of a two semester course on church history here from this pulpit on Monday night. So get ready for it. And um, y'all get to come for free because you're sitting here, but we'll have hopefully some people who are uh, taking it as students, and, uh, and then we'll have a number of people online. So uh, that's good, and I've started working on that already as if I didn't have anything else to do. Well, I'm glad somebody laughed. <laughs> How should a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, we need to make sure we're in right relationship with the Lord. We need to confess sin, which means to just in silent prayer admit or acknowledge our sin to the Lord and instantly he forgives us and then goes even further and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We're restored to that ongoing uh, fellowship, that active walk with the Lord. And uh, so after a few moments of silent prayer, then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so thankful that you are our rock. You are always faithful. You are immutable. You never change. You are stable. We base our lives on you. We depend upon you. And as we watch the world around us go from change to other change again and again, we don't know where things are headed. We've never seen the world or our country in the kind of disarray that we see. And we're not sure what will take place or how to plan because of these uh, stay-at-home orders and lockdowns and mask orders and everything else. But Father, we know that we can depend on you. And in a lot of ways, we can just take advantage of this time to grow spiritually, to take advantage of each situation as an opportunity to claim promises, to trust you, to walk with you, because we know that when we see things happening like this on a global scale, that this is something that you are 
working out. You are changing things up, whether we're a week away from the rapture, a month away, a decade away, or half a century or more away. We know that you are setting the stage for that grand event when our Lord comes back and he'll call us up to him and, and we'll meet him in the clouds. So, Father, we keep our focus on him and we keep our focus on our purpose and mission in this life so that we cannot be, uh, be set off course or distracted by all these things that are going on. Father, we pray tonight that as we continue our study that you would help us to understand, get some perspective on what's going on in the world around us as well as in uh, past history and understanding your word. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I want to start tonight by looking at Isaiah chapter 1. So open your Bibles with me to Isaiah uh, chapter 1. Isaiah 1. And we're continuing a study of rebellion. I started two classes back, uh, working our way through a number of things. And if you remember from last Tuesday night, I ended and I raised the issue and gave you a teaser that what we are going to need to answer as we go through this, because it's a question that I've asked many, many times over the years and wrestled with the different data that's out there. And it's a question that many people have asked me over the years, and that is, uh, the way we normally put this is, was the American War in 17, that started in 1775, was that a revolution, commonly called the Revolutionary War, the American Revolution, or was that a war for independence? And the distinction is great. One is a rebellion, and the other is a just war, a justified war. And that's really, in a technical sense, the correct language to use, is it a just war? And we're going to see some interesting things on that before we finish tonight. We're not going to get there yet, but it's like a lot of things in life. You ask a simple question, but the answer is not simple. If we really want to grasp it, we have to work our way through Scripture, and then we have to work our way through how Scripture was interpreted and how it was understood at the time of the American War for Independence. So we're talking about what is the issue, what, what's the issue about rebellion? One of the things that hit me some years ago as I was contemplating this question in a passage, I'm sure I was teaching one of the passages dealing with authority, is to just recognize why is it that again and again and again the Bible emphasizes submission to authority. We have all kinds of authorities in our life. We have a government authority. We have a state authority. We have a, in Texas, we have county authorities. We have city authorities. We have authorities at work. We have authorities in the military. We have authorities in the classroom. Uh, we are surrounded by authority. And the scriptures are very clear that we are to obey authority, to submit to authority. We have authority in the home. We have authority in marriage. We have authority in just about anything we do unless we just go out backpacking by ourselves up and down the Appalachian Trail with nobody around. And even then there are going to be signs telling us what we can and can't do. So authority is fundamental to, to our lives. And Scripture addresses that from the very beginning God makes an issue out of it, and so we need to ask that question, why is this so important, and when are we to obey, and when are we to rebel or disobey the authority? And so I wanted to start with a passage I was reading this morning, and I'm preparing one day, someday, to teach Isaiah and so I've done a number of different things to prepare myself. I've been, for about the last six or eight months, I've been periodically reading through Isaiah over and over again through, through a given month. And now I'm working on reading it in the Hebrew. And it struck me this morning when I came to verses 2 through 4, the language of verse 2. But I want to read this whole thing in context. Isaiah starts off basically uh, charging... Israel with their disobedience to God. 
And this sets the stage for many of the prophecies that come later in the book, and it's a, it's a great introduction. A lot of people wonder why Isaiah 6, which is when God commissions Isaiah, is in the sixth chapter, not at the beginning. And you might think of it as when you pick up a book and you read the introduction, and then you get into the first chapter, and the first chapter starts taking you into uh, the real topic of the book. And it starts chronologically, maybe at a different place from the introduction. And that's somewhat like Isaiah 1 through 5. It's, it's an introduction to the major themes that are in the book. And then we get into the call of uh, Isaiah, which establishes his authority. But here he is giving a vision, according to verse 1, and he is relating that to the people, and it is uh, how he begins this. He says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. Reminds us of several Deuteronomic passages where Moses says, calls upon the heavens and the earth to, uh, to witness something. So it has that sense. And then he says, For Yahweh has spoken. And this is what Yahweh says. He says, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider, alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. This is, right away you get the sense, this is not going to be a feel-good message. Right away you know that Isaiah is not concerned about winning friends and influencing people with that introduction. But I just want to focus on one thing, and that is in verse 2. He describes Israel, even though a lot that is here is in a covenant format. The word covenant never appears in Isaiah. But the language, the rest of the language, very covenantal, and this calling upon heaven and earth to witness is so typical of things that we see in Deuteronomy and other passages of the law. And then it shifts, and God speaks of Israel not as a a covenant breaker per se, not as just a lawbreaker, but as family. He says, I have nourished and brought up children. He speaks to them as a father to his children. And then he says, for they have rebelled against me. And the word there that we have for rebelled is a verb I talked about last week. I related it to David's confession in Psalm 51. And this is the word pesha, meaning to rebel or to revolt. The theological word book of the Old Testament says it's a breach of relationships, civil or religious, between two parties. So it can be between two people. It can be between one group of people and another group of people. It can be between a group of people and a government. So it has that essence, essential idea of rejecting an authority. And this is a word that is used in a number of other passages. Just later in the chapter, in verse 28, God says, the destruction of transgressors. Same word, so I'd prefer to translate the destruction of rebels and of sinners. And it's talking, that's what a sinner is. A sinner is a, rebe a rebel against God. The destruction of rebels and of sinners shall be together. And those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. And this is talking about really a couple of different areas uh, related to divine judgment, as we'll see in just a minute. Uh, but that's what it's focusing on. If we rebel against the Lord, if we are sinners, then we're putting ourselves in legal jeopardy before the Lord where we are, uh, we are ready for divine discipline or divine judgment. Ezekiel 2, verse 3, God's commission of Ezekiel here. Son of man, which is a frequent title in Ezekiel for Ezekiel. Son of man, I'm sending you to the children of Israel. Then he describes his children. 
Some of you may have children who have been like this at one point or another. To a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. Now, this is another Hebrew word, but it is a synonym. It's, it refers to a rebellion. And their fathers have rebelled against me. Now, in English, you wouldn't translate it the same way because you don't want all those same words there, but it catches the point that Ezekiel is making. Their fathers have rebelled against me to this very day. In Hosea, we have two, two verses. Set the trumpet to your mouth, Hosea 8.1. Set the trumpet to your mouth. When you hear a trumpet blow, that's always to get people's attention, to assemble the troops, to make an announcement, something of that nature. Set the trumpet to your mouth. He shall come like an eagle against the house of the Lord. This is an announcement of judgment. Hosea is, is talking about um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar coming. He shall come like an eagle against the house of Yahweh, because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against the law. Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. Okay, that's a key phrase. The ways of the Lord are right. The subject here at the end is the ways of the Lord. And you have two options. Either the righteous walk in them, or... Rebels stumble in them. What's a sign of a rebel? He stumbles when it comes to the mandates of God. Stumbles when it comes to obeying the Lord. So let's look at just some summary here of what I covered last time. Remember last time we looked at Absalom's rebellion, Sheba's rebellion, uh, compared them, drew some principles, and then began to look at the original rebellion, which was Satan's rebellion in Isaiah chapter uh, 14, verses 12 to 14, and Ezekiel chapter uh, 28, and that covers a, a passage from about verse 12 down to about verse 19 or 20. Rebellion begins in the heart. Rebellion begins in the heart. It is a mental attitude sin. It is a rejection of authority. It flows out of arrogance, as does every other sin. But rebellion or disrespect for authority always begins in an arrogant heart. And the heart is the mind. The center of our, of our lives is our thinking. Proverbs says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It is the seat of our thinking. And first and foremost, as an act of rebellion, it is always an act of rebellion against God. You may think you're disobeying your parents. You may think you're getting one over on your boss. You may think you're doing something, getting around, uh, sneaking around a commanding officer, somebody breaking some rule. But every act of rebellion is first and foremost an act against God. Because God has said, obey this authority. And so to disobey is first and foremost a rejection of God and its disobedience to God and his standards. Therefore, every act of rebellion is first and foremost a spiritual problem, which means you can't really fix it. You may put a Band-Aid on it. You may have uh, other ways of ameliorating it or mitigating it for a while. But all rebellion is a spiritual problem and a sin problem. And until that is addressed, you're going to continue to have consequences from that rebellious nature. And I'll tell you something. I've said this a few times from the pulpit. It's interesting. Some of you have been around more than a decade or two, and you can remember when what you heard when you were young from many, many different pastors was sermons against legalism emphasizing grace. Remember the sin nature or, or maybe you were in a church where you heard a legalistic sermon. <laughs> that was the problem. And uh, is, is legalism. Legalism produces a self-righteousness. Legalism is one trend of our sin nature. But the opposite side is antinomianism, or rejection of law, rejection of absolutes, or rejection of authority. And so, so legalism is represented in the Bible by the Pharisees. They are making legalistic structures out of every law, 613 laws in the Mosaic Law. 
And then each of those, they developed an oral law where you might have one particular law and there might be 20 sub-laws. Now you think, boy, that's, that gets pretty heavy. Have you looked at the U.S. law code lately? We have laws, and then once you start trying to apply them, this situation comes up, and that situation comes up, and another question, another question. Next thing you know, you have 15 other laws just to explain exactly what you meant in the first law. So you have this, this problem of, of legalism. But legalism hasn't been a problem in either churches or in this country since the 60s. I'll put a date on it, 1964. A lot of things changed then. Sidney Alstrom, who was the uh, well-known dean of the church history department at Yale, published a book on the history of religion among the, in the American people. And he had a large book, I had to read it, part of my reading list years ago <coughs> in seminary. And uh, one of the things that, that he does as he's so periodizing, you know, he's got a chart. These are the different periods of the American history, the colonial period, the federal period, period before the Civil War, period after the Civil War, Reconstruction, all these different periods. The per he breaks it at 1963 to 64. 1964 on, we're in the post-Puritan era. What he meant by that was up till 64, this culture was dominated by the influence of the Bible. It began to fade from World War I to 64, but what happened in 64? You have a Supreme Court decision, takes prayer out of the schools. The year before Kennedy was assassinated, you have uh, the Beatles come in right around there. A whole lot of things changed in our culture that all, not, I'm not saying they're all related to each other, but they're all the result of changes that been, had been uh, growing in our Western civilization for the previous uh, 30, 40, 50 years. And so that's, that's the point. From that point on, we've been in an antinomian culture. We've been in a culture that uh, prides itself on question authority. How many times have you seen that on a bumper sticker? Question authority. Is that what the Bible says? I'm not saying that there aren't times when you shouldn't question authority, but the scripture is that that reflects a mentality uh, where you are you're always going to judge everybody that's in authority, and that's antinomianism. Uh, the Bible doesn't say question authority; it says honor the king, submit to authorities. That doesn't mean you submit to everything. We'll get into that tonight, but that's uh, that's what the scripture says. So rebellion begins in the heart. And Jeremiah says that the heart is deceitful and wicked above all things who can know it. And so it is the mentality of our soul that is so deceptive. Second thing we learned is that spiritual rebels will be destroyed in time and in eternity. See, in history, in your lifetime, if you're rebellious, there will be divine discipline or divine judgment because of your rebelliousness and disobedience to authority. If you are an unbeliever, you will suffer the consequences, perhaps for your rebellion in time, but you'll also be judged for it at the great white throne judgment for all eternity. But rebel believers will have failure at the judgment seat of Christ, shame at the judgment seat of Christ, but they're still gonna to go to heaven because they trusted in Christ even though they've had a life of rebellion against God. So spiritual rebels will be destroyed. They'll be judged. There are going to be consequences both in their lifetime as well as for, for eternity. Galatians 6, 7 says, uh, Don't be deceived. God is not, not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that he will also reap. And that's just talking about the natural consequences of bad decisions. And then sometimes God comes along and says, well, that's just not enough. We're going to, have, we're going to intensify it a little bit because you just haven't been learning your lessons well. And so that's, that's when we move from just the normal consequences of bad decisions to when it's divine discipline. Third, we saw that arrogance is the original sin of Satan. 
It started in his heart. That's what Ezekiel tells us, until pride was discovered in your heart, in your thinking. And so he is arrogant. He wants to be like God. He wants to rule over the angels. He wants to rule over the creation. He wants to be worshipped like God. That's Isaiah chapter uh, 14, 12 to 14. So arrogance is the original sin of Satan in which all human beings have followed because Satan enticed Eve and then Eve enticed Adam and Adam sinned. And in Adam's fall, we sinned all as the old Puritan reader said. Fourth, in the rebellions of both Absalom and Sheba, we learn a few things. They first reject God before they reject David as king. Because re they reject God, and then what's the fallout from that? Once you reject God, you, you say, even in a moment in time, okay, you got a 30-minute window when you let your rebellious nature go out. First thing you're doing is, you know it's wrong, you say, I don't care what God says. I'm going to do this. And then you know you're in trouble. First you reject God, and then they rejected God's plan for Israel, which was David as the king over a united Israel. Now David's going to, I mean, God's going to change his plan to a divided Israel after Solomon dies. But at this point, God's plan was David as king and a united Israel. So they're following Lucifer and thinking that they had a right to the throne. Lucifer wanted the throne of God. They wanted the throne of David. At least Absalom wanted the throne of David. Sheba just wanted to go off with the ten tribes and have his own throne. Rebels, spiritual or political, base their position on lies. That shouldn't surprise us. In John chapter 8, Jesus is in one of those head-to-head -head confrontations with the Pharisees. And he says to these righteous, holy men, because they're the leaders, they are the most spiritually focused group in Israel at the time. They were part of the Hasidim, the holy ones. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. Well, th that was a real slap in the face to say you're of your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. So what happens, Satan is arrogant. Arrogance produces a self-deception and it's delusional. And so Satan is not living on the basis of truth. He is living in a lie. He is, he is what's the old, uh, the old story that a neurotic builds castles in the air and a psychotic moves in and pays rent to the psychiatrist. And that's what happens when, in sin. We're, we're neurotic. I mean, Freud just changed the language. Biblical language is you're sinning and you're self-deluded. And when you get psychotic is you really believe your arrogant delusions. So the, 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 the devil doesn't stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. He's speaking out of his heart. And his heart is... Fallen, he is a liar and the father of it. Okay, the fifth thing that we learned in our study is that arrogance led to self-promotion. Absalom is promoting himself. Sheba is promoting himself. Self-promotion just strengthens self-deception. And arrogant, arrogant delusions divorce us from reality. When we really have that break from reality, they call it a psychotic break, but it's a break from reality. It's a break from truth. It's a break from objectiveness. And so we have a whole country filled with people now. They're out rioting, turning over statues. They're ignorant of history. They, uh, they, they don't know what they're doing. I mean, last week there was talk. I, I haven't read anything to see if it happened, but there was going to be a group that tried to topple that 86-foot-tall statue of Sam Houston up by Huntsville. Why? If you're concerned about black lives, so was Sam Houston. Sam Houston was against slavery. Sam Houston was the governor of Texas when uh, they voted to secede, and he, he voted against it. He tried to argue, stop it, did everything he could. He thought that it was the worst decision in the world for, for Texas to secede from the Union. And here they are, they're just 
willy-nilly doing that. And they tried to tear down, or they did tear down, Frederick Douglass's statue somewhere in Ohio. Frederick Douglass, who was an escaped slave, who's one of the voices, one of the most articulate voices of his time as an, uh, as an escaped slave for, for, um, for abolition of slavery. And yet, they've torn that down. It makes no sense. See, when you're operating on arrogance, you are living in the world of irrationalism. And it can't be explained by logic at all. It divorces us from reality. Sixth, in all of these cases, we see an appeal to human emotions rather than truth or facts. That's what Absalom was doing. He's out there, oh, the king doesn't, David doesn't really care about you, and, and, uh, but I'll take care of you. And so he makes him feel good. And we have too much of that in pulpits today. You don't want to make people feel, good to feel bad to make them feel bad. You just want to teach, teach the Scripture. And any one of us who's, who's honest will say, well, I read the Scripture sometimes. I don't feel too good about myself because it exposes our failures and our arrogance and our, and our sin. When emotion overrides reason and facts, and that's where we are today. You know, Pastor Thiem had a great phrase. I can't tell you how many people in the last month have said, wasn't that, that just describes it, the emotional revolt of the soul. We are seeing it, just turn on the news. We are seeing it every single day, and that's what it is. Instead of thinking, we're emoting, and people have just lost all sense. When emotion overrides reason and facts, the result is delusion. I said this last week, truth, facts, do not care about our emotions. The teaching of Scripture doesn't care about how you feel. Not once did Jesus sit down, he went a woman at the well and said, well, how do you feel about this thing? You can go through the Scriptures. Not once does God come to Abraham, sit down, we're going to have dinner. How do you feel about things? It's been a while since, since I said anything to you. You still don't have that child. How do you feel about that? It's not about how we feel, it's about what we think. Over and over again, it is changing our thinking, not our feelings. Truth cares about what is biblically correct and what glorifies God, not what makes us feel good. Somebody ought to needlepoint that onto a pillow and start selling it. Okay, last time we looked, I changed it up a little bit. We looked at how do you evaluate something? So here's the evaluation. We're going to expand this later on. But we talk about anything. You're evaluating the claims of Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, Islam, uh, any kind of um, polytheism, any kind of cult. What, what do they think about God? We, the Bible says God is a personal, infinite God. He's righteous and just, and he created everything. He's the ultimate authority. And he created everything, and it was good. He created man. And he created mankind in the image of God, which means man is not an animal. How many of you all remember when you were in elementary school that man is just another animal? Man is not an animal. Man is in the image of God. He is not an animal. There may be some similarities, but it's not the similarities that matter. It's the differences. Just look at a man and a woman. You know, as a man, you look at a woman... She has a lot of similarities to a man. But as Maurice Chevalier said in Gigi, viva la différence. That's what makes the world go round. Love makes the world go round. Okay, so the problem is sin. We're corrupt. Our heart is deceitful and wicked. The solution starts at the cross, redemption. There we become a new creature in Christ, and then by studying the Bible, we can change all, and start working on all of those aspects of sin in our life and dealing with the rebelliousness of our soul. In history, God has a, history for the Christian is linear. Now, the reason I'm saying this is we're going to take a look at Marxism. Marxism is often said to be a Christian heresy. Have you ever heard that? Part of the reason is because Marx, every pagan view 
other than a few, and they are, are cyclical. Their view of history, just endless cycles. You know, history repeats itself. No, it doesn't. There are similarities, but history doesn't repeat itself. It's not identical, but you get into Hinduism, Buddhism, you get this endless cycle. Okay, but Christianity, it's linear. God is taking us to a goal and a purpose, and it's the messianic kingdom. Marx borrowed that, perverted it. And it's working towards a, it's, it's a directional. We're moving towards a worker's paradise. See, he stole the kingdom idea and transformed it. And causation, causation for the Christian is divine providence. So we just line those things up. But we always have to start with God and his word. Now, last time we started off with Satan and his rebellion. And I'm just going to take you through a quick panorama of rebels in scripture. It's not long after the fall when uh, Adam and Eve rebel against God. They disobey God. They eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And there's a penalty. There's spiritual death. And then there's all kinds of consequences that are going to impact the animal kingdom, they impact uh, the woman, they impact the man, they impact the serpent, they impact the ground. Now it's going to bring forth, it's going to bring forth thorns, and, uh, and so it's going to be difficult for man to get food out of the ground because the ground's now going to fight him, and he's going to bring forth uh, thorns and thistles. It's one reason that Jesus had a crown of thorns when he went to the cross. It's emblematic of the fact that, you know, of the curse of sin. And he's going to bear the penalty of sin on, on the cross. And so Adam and Eve suffer consequences. We're setting that under divine institution number one on Thursday night on individual responsibility. And they have a child, firstborn. Eve thinks this is the promised seed, calls him Cain. I've acquired him from the Lord. Cain didn't turn out to be so hot. And he gets jealous of his brother Abel because uh, Abel brings a better sacrifice. It's better because he obeyed God and brought an animal sacrifice, and Cain brought a sacrifice of his own produce from the ground. And then he gets mad. And when he gets mad, God comes to him. How would you like it if you were getting ready to sin and all of a sudden God showed up and had a little heart-to-heart -heart with you every time? Well, that's what happened with Cain. If you do well, will you not be accepted? In other words, your sacrifice, it will be accepted if you do the right thing. And if you don't, sin lies at the door. The word for sin there is missing the mark. And the picture here is of, an, of a ravenous creature crouching, ready to pounce and devour. And that's the word that shows up. It's translated desire, but it has that idea of desiring to control or to dominate. And it's desire. Sin wants to control you. But, God says, to Cain, who is not a church-age believer, doesn't have the Bible, doesn't have the Holy Spirit, doesn't have all these promises of God. And God says, but you should rule over it. Isn't that interesting? God tells Cain, you've got to control your sin nature. And this is what parents have to teach their children, to have self-discipline and control their sin nature. They can't eradicate it, but they have to learn self-discipline. Otherwise, they're just going to be antinomian rebels. Well, we know how things turned out. Cain killed Abel. Cain is kicked out of that area, and he has to go off. He founds a city. They start having children. Adam and Eve have other children. Civilization develops before the flood. And then God looks at civilization on the earth, and he says in Genesis 6, 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent, that's the motivation of every thought, and that's true from our sin nature. If we're not saved, the motivation of every thought is evil. The intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Every intent, evil continually. It was bad. So God brings 
judgment on the earth. Again, every human being outside of Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives, are rebelling against the God who made them. So God brings judgment. Again and again we see rebels get judged. So, last week as I was teaching on this, I got a couple of questions. Well, what about the Exodus event? Was that a rebellion? What about um, the setting up of the northern kingdom of Israel? Was that a rebellion? So I want to talk about that because that sets us up to the fact that sometimes there are extenuating circumstances and we have to look at, this gives us a paradigm, a pattern for looking at every situation in Scripture. So I drew this little chart today. Up in the left we have God. He's the absolute ultimate authority. He has a direct authority over people. He is our God. We obey Him. He is the ultimate authority. Then, over here, we have a crown representing the governmental authority, and we have a police badge which represents the enforcement of those laws of the land, the criminal laws especially. And the police are the ones that help uh, provide order and peace. And we live in a time right now, we all know this, when you're, there's a lot of talk about people, well, we need to defund police. That's, this, that's the worst thing we could possibly do. Because poli police provide order. And when you defund the police and you start having all of these hostile attitudes towards the police coming from their governing authority, which is the city government, or the county government, or the state government, how do you think they feel? You have, and I know most of you know a few police officers. We've had a few in this congregation. I have known many different police officers over the course of my life. None of them are racist. In fact, in the last two or three weeks, month or so, I have talked to a number of law enforcement people who've gone through training. They are trained and trained and trained to avoid any kind of semblance of, of racism. In fact, uh, in the uh, uh, black parts of town, they try to always pair up. Uh, if they don't have two uh, black police officers together, they try to pair them up, uh, uh, white or black or two, uh, Hispanic and black, but they try to avoid all uh, of this. And studies, and I may mention them coming up, but by Heather McDonald and others who have looked through all the statistics that are provided by FBI and law enforcement, that there's only a very small percentage of, of black citizens who are illegally shot by police officers. It's extremely small. I think two or three years ago, there were like 19 in the incidents in the whole year in 2000, maybe in 2017 or 2018. It's very, very small. And yet there's a propaganda that's been building. Now part of that, we'll talk about this later, but part of that has resonance in the black community because it appears to many, and I've talked to many, and I trust them, I've known these men, they're good men, uh, good pastors, that they feel harassed at times. And there may be some um, police officers that do that, but they're just a minority. But when you start taking the few bad apples and paint with that wide brush and make these generalizations about every police officer, then the end result is a destruction of respect for authority, respect for the enforcement of laws. And we're going to see what Scripture says about that in a minute. So we have, in this diagram, we have God, we have people, we have delegated authority that goes through the crown, goes through the government of a, of a nation or a state or a county or a city, and then the in, enforcement of that. Now, the question that comes up is what happens when the crown, 
when the government tells us to do something that is a contradiction to what God has told us. And the solution that we see in Scripture is that we obey God instead of man when human authority contradicts God's authority. And that's exactly what Peter and John said in Acts chapter 5, as we'll see. But I want to just quickly go through a couple of cases since I'm going through the Old Testament. We had Exodus. We had a question about Exodus, so I just want to talk about this briefly. In Exodus chapter 1, we had the case of the midwives. These are the Hebrew midwives, and they are helping with the birth of the Hebrew children. And they are brought into Pharaoh, and Pharaoh gives them a direct order. So what we have here in this scenario is the Pharaoh is going to tell the midwives that you need to kill every male baby. In the ancient Near East, a male baby was as, males were the essence of national development. And so if you wipe out the males, you'll wipe out the national identity. And so they're given that order. But they, they trust God. They are obedient to God. And in fact, in Exodus 1.17, we're told, but the midwives feared God. Now, that's an important term. They feared God. They were submissive to God's authority, not Pharaoh's authority. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. Go back to our, wait a minute, we've got to back up. Pharaoh said, kill all the male babies. God said, every life is valuable, every life is precious, you don't commit murder. So what are they going to do? They're going to obey God rather than man because they fear the Lord. In Exodus 1.21 we read, and so it was because the midwives feared God. So twice we have this phrase related to fearing God. That's their motivation for disobeying Pharaoh. And because that's the reason they disobeyed Pharaoh, it's not because they did what they wanted to do, but because they did what God wanted them to do, that he, that he provided households for them. He blessed them because they obeyed him rather than the, the immoral order from Pharaoh. And that tells us right away that those in authority can give illegal orders, can give uh, immoral orders, and that they can violate the law in the orders that they give. And when a believer is in that situation, they have to obey that, that authority. Uh, the authority of God, not the authority of man. A couple chapters later, we have another example where Moses comes in and tells Pharaoh, God says, let my people go. you got to let us go. Pharaoh said, no, not going to do it. God said, hmm, we'll see. Took him through ten successive plagues. Horrible judgments that just devastated the whole culture, devastated the, um, the economy, and in the end, it destroyed the army of Egypt, the greatest power on the earth at that time. And so this isn't a rebellion because the people didn't leave until the Pharaoh said, please get out of here, take them, go. I'm done with you after the 10th plague. So they obeyed Pharaoh and they left, but they did it because God established that and God gave them the, the basis for doing that. The problem we run into in setting up these kinds of situations where do we obey God or do we obey man is a misreading of many of the obedience passages in the New Testament. We're going to get into that in just a minute. So option one is represented in history by the Stuart line of kings, James I of England, who was previously James VI of Scotland. He's the King James of the King James Bible. He's the one who commissioned or, or gave permission for that translation to be made. And his son Charles I, who lost his head over his, uh, the idea that he had a divine right to absolute authority. 
So it's usually set up this way. Either you have this, here's the option. The divine right of kings is that Christians are required to submit blindly to every law. That's the key. Every law and policy of the government. That when God says he ordained the authorities and we're to obey the authorities, that means you don't question anything whatsoever. You obey, have to obey everything. And there are Christians who think that. That's not right. That's not what the Bible teaches. Option two, this is called the fallacy of the excluded middle. And what that means is it sets things up as if there's only this option or that option when there's actually another option. God is in favor of orderly government. 1 Corinthians 14, God is a God of order. He established government. He authorized it in the Noahic Covenant in Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. God is for government, not anarchy. He is not for tyranny. God hates disorder and chaos. Anarchy and tyranny are inherently against authority. So God despises anarchy. He despises tyranny. God established the institutions of government but does not approve of every government because, according to this line of reasoning, there are governments that go over the line and are tyrannical. Therefore, opposition to tyranny while holding to government is permissible. Okay? This is a fundamental principle that has come down. Actually, it started being articulated, as we'll see tonight if I get there, with Augustine, who was the Bishop of Hippo. Now, he brought a lot of garbage into the church. We understand that. But, but this is where the line of, of, uh, of thinking goes. And it was, he was the first one to really clearly articulate a doctrine of just war. And just war is just because of the overturning an evil monarch. Now we see in another example in Acts 4.19. Now there's a number of examples, of course, in Daniel, and I'm just not going to go through all of those uh, different examples. But before we skip there, I want to go over the case of, uh, of the tax revolt in 1 Kings 11 and 12. And there we're told, it's at the end of uh, Solomon's life, and there is a man who is a, a, a strong man. He's considered a mighty man. He's a warrior. He is adept. He has leadership qualities. He is a friend of Solomon's. He's in Solomon's administration. And he is on his way to Jerusalem when we get to uh, 1 Kings 11.29. And we read it happened at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah the Shilonite, so he's from Shiloh or Shiloh, which is where the tabernacle was for almost 400 years. Ahijah the Shilonite met him on the way and he had clothed him with the new garment. So he went to Neiman Marcus and brought a brand new suit and he comes out and he is dressed in a new robe and he comes to Jeroboam, he says, I want you to um, take this garment. I want you to tear it into ten pieces. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. So he's establishing the authority comes from God. Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give ten tribes to you. So this isn't a rebellion because God is authorizing it. He is actually bringing a judgment on Israel by dividing it because of their idolatry under Solomon and because of their rebellion against God. In 1 Kings 11.40, uh, Solomon got wind of this and sought to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam fled to Egypt to Shishak, the king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. And then in 1 Kings 12, 15, we read that after Rehoboam, Solomon's son, became king, he, um, he didn't listen to his elderly advisors, and he uh, imposed a heavy tax 
on uh, all of the people, and so the northern kingdom left. They split off. It was an act of separation. And so the, uh, you know, Jeroboam, I mean, Rehoboam attacks them, and there's, there's a war, but the southern kingdom loses because God is behind it. God has authorized the establishment of a divided kingdom. So again, it's not a rebellion. God is the one who's telling them what to do. We get to Acts chapter 4. We have a situation where Peter and John have been arrested because they're preaching the gospel in the temple. And so they're brought before the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin tells them that uh, we're going to release you, but you cannot talk about Jesus anymore. You cannot proclaim this message anymore anymore. You have to keep your mouth shut. And so Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So they gave them fair warning. They're not being nasty. They're not not talking in an arrogant way. They're talking in a very humble way. They're saying, we have to do what God said to do. I'm sorry, but we understand you don't want us to say this, but we're going to have to speak the things that God told us to speak. Then we go into the next chapter. They will, in the intervening uh, chapter, they go out and preach the gospel. They get arrested again and put in jail again and put in prison. 5.18, they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night, the angel, an angel of the Lord, not the angel of the Lord, but an angel of the Lord, opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, this is a divine mandate. So again, God is giving them direct revelation, and that, that trumps everything else. Go, stand in the temple, and speak to the people all the words of this life. Now, how would you like that? We've seen a little taste of disorder and chaos around here. And um, right in the middle of a riot, or what will turn into a riot, God tells you, go and speak what I tell you to speak and give them the gospel. So they get arrested for that, and then they're brought before the Sanhedrin. That's the word council there, the Sanhedrin. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, the Sanhedrin, and the high priest asked them, saying, did, not, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? Didn't we tell you not to do this? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. Now the result of this was that they got, the Sanhedrin got angry, they were furious, they plotted to kill them. And they called for the apostles, they beat them, and they commanded them again not to speak in the name of Jesus. But what did the apostles do? Daily in the temple, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Messiah. So what we see here is when God tells us to do something and then the civil government tells us to, or any authority tells us to do something or not to do something that God has instructed us on, then we obey God rather than man. But we do it in a kind, gracious, gentle way. It is not to be done out of any anger, not to be done out of any sense of... uh, a vengeance or bitterness or retribution, no mental attitude sins, but to be relaxed and do exactly what God said to do. Now, I think this is a pattern for every act when we disagree with the government. We have to act in a very humble way. Sometimes it's difficult. I know nobody here in the congregation has ever thought, uh, ever said a bad word about any uh, body that in government authority. Um, we won't name any names, but we're not supposed to do that. And I've had to try really hard that, you know, I just can't say those things that come to my mind when I'm going to talk about different government officials. As a believer, that is not to characterize us at all. And the reason given is 
Romans 13. I'm just going to go through these, hit a few hot spots. We've talked about this many times. Let every soul be subject to governing authorities. Every means there's no exception. It doesn't matter what ethnicity you are. It doesn't matter what country you're a citizen of. It does not matter uh, whether you are male or female. Every soul, every believer is to be subject to governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And so some people say, well, it wasn't bad. Of course Paul could say that. No, it was bad. Nero was the emperor. He was, he was crazy. He was a homicidal maniac. And he is the emperor. And so God is allowing him in his permissive will to be the ruler of the Roman Empire for a reason. And that means that there are times when people we think are idiots, un- inexperienced fools, who are in positions of authority, and we have to say, well, that's God's permissive will. We're getting the leader that God wants us to have, so we're going to have to learn a little humility while they're in authority. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Now, that doesn't mean that if that authority tells me to do something that God tells me not to do, that I'm to obey them. But if they're telling me to do legitimate things, then I have to do it. If they're telling me to do something or not to do something that is not addressed by the word of God, then I, then I have to do it. Because, verse 2, therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. Now, in our country, we have the right to assemble. We have the right to protest. We have, to do, we have the right to, uh, to demonstrate. But I don't think that's what a believer should do. We should be involved in government. We should be involved in talking to our representatives. We should be calling them, writing them, letting our voice be heard. But the way to do that, I do not think, is by getting out on the streets and marching, especially in an environment where too many people are, are fueling anger and fueling resentment and fueling bitterness. And we've seen what's happened. It, 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 in one sense, it doesn't matter what started this because we know where these things go because there are forces and organizations and people who want chaos in this country. And it's easy for them to slip, and they have slipped a lot of people in who create further chaos. So a believer has to live according to a higher standard. Verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Then do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. Just show respect, treat them with respect, and trust God to handle the situation. In verse 4 we read, For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, now he's talking about Nero. The, Nero later starts burning Christians as torches to light the streets in Rome. Okay, he's not talking about a good administration. He's talking about one of the most evil administrations in history. He is God's minister to you for good, but if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. The sword in Scripture. You go back to Garden of Eden, first time a sword's mentioned. Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden. They're expelled from the garden, and God sets up a guard, sets up a troop of cherubs around the garden with swords, flaming swords. It's the ability to take life legitimately. And that's what that means, is that government authority has the right to carry weapons and to take life. That is a heavy burden for a law enforcement officer. And sometimes we have, uh, there's a bad apple in every bunch. There are bad pastors. There's a lot of bad pastors. There are bad, there are bad police officers. There are bad black people, black, bad white people, bl- bad Asians. Everybody's bad. We're corrupt. And there are some that get, try to get away with it. But they're the exception. They're not the rule. He is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. 
Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, submission to authority. Taxation is legitimate, not tyrannical taxation, but taxation. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due taxes, to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Paul says the same thing, 1 Peter, 1 Peter 2.13, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme, or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God. How many people go around, I want to know what God wants me to do. Well, this is what God says to do. Is to show respect Submit to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. You're doing it for the Lord, not for yourself. Or to governors are those sent. This is the will of God. By doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. He says exactly what Paul says in Romans 13. Now, some people try to make an issue out of the fact that when Paul wrote Romans 13, it was probably earlier in Nero's reign, and he wasn't as bad as he got later, but he was still bad. But in 1 Peter, it's at the end of Nero's reign when he was so divorced from reality and he was really bad and really evil. And that we don't use liberty as a cloak for vice. You don't use your liberty, and even though you can do something, something that may be permitted under the Constitution doesn't mean you should do it. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. And that goes for the Christian life as well. And that, that's where you get into the law of doubtful things, which is another topic. But just because you can eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols, does that mean you should? You can. It's not a sin. But does that mean you should? Okay, well, I want to wrap this up in about five minutes, so we'll fly low. We're going to go back in history. We're going to go back to the Reformation and the foundation for understanding these issues about uh, rebellion against a legitimate rebellion against an authority or resistance to an authority, just resistance to authority, is laid out in a document called the Magdeburg Confession, or it's also known as the Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrate. Now, last week I told you that I talked to Mark Hall, who wrote this book on Is the Founding of America a Christian? And we, we got to talking about the American War for Independence. And uh, he's working on a book on that topic right now. And uh, he brought this up. And he said, this idea of the doctrine of the lesser magistrate is really the foundation. And this was, uh, this was part of most reformed, you know, reformed theology, reformed confessions of faith coming out of the uh, Protestant Reformation. Okay? And I said, well, that's like the Magdeburg Confession. He was not familiar with this one. So I'm going to run you through this, a little bit of history. October 31st, 1517, is Reformation Day. That is when Martin Luther, who was an Augustinian monk, so as an Augustinian monk, he had studied Augustine's theology, much to his detriment, but he understood the just war issue. That's background. Luther nails these 95 theses, that's discussion points, debating points, to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. Now, what we know about this is that the church door is like the neighborhood bulletin board, and if you want to have a public debate over some significant issue, then you would put this up on the bulletin board, and he called for public debate. And that was in 1517. And this began a break with the Roman Catholic Church. But remember this, that was not his intent. He did not want to start a, a, another spinoff. There had never been a spin outside of the Orthodox Church in the East that broke off. There, there really wasn't. There was just the Roman Catholic Church. He had no idea. He had no desire to cause a split. He's, he wanted to reform a very, very corrupt papacy, and he wasn't the only one who was pointing out how corrupt it was. So he nails these 95 debate points to the church door. Now, four years later, in 1521, 
Uh, he is tried by Emperor Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire. And always, I always remember this. It wasn't holy, it wasn't Roman, and it wasn't an empire. But they did have, an, have authority over much of, of what we call Europe today. Charles V issued a decree, a decree on May the 25th, 1521, called the Edict of Worms. And it declared in part... For this reason, we forbid, this is a law, empire-wide law, we forbid anyone from this time forward to dare, either by words or by deeds, to receive, defend, sustain, or favor the said Martin Luther. If you look at him, you better be scowling. On the contrary, we want him to be apprehended and punished as a notorious heretic, as he deserves to be brought personally before us or to be securely guarded until those who have captured him inform us. Whereupon we will order the appropriate manner of proceeding against the said Luther. Those who will help in his capture will be rewarded generously for their good work. So Luther gets erected, uh, arrested and, uh, or excuse me, Luther is not arrested because he was protected by Prince Frederick III of Saxony. Remember, this time Germany was just a lot of different smaller countries uh, under different rulers. And so um, uh, Prince Frederick III of Saxony protects him. Now, this is when you get the development of the doctrine of the lesser magistrate, which basically means that when a higher authority enacts an unjust law, then a lower authority has the right and the responsibility to interpose himself between the higher authority and the citizen to protect the citizen from an unjust law. That means that if the governor of Texas were to propose an unjust law, then the county sheriff can step in and, and prevent its application and enforcement in the county. And that is true. There's a lot of power given to county sheriffs under the law. The lesser authority can block an unjust law. A lot of application came from this. So in, um, what happens then is that in 1531, some 10 years later, um, the town of Magdeburg joins a group of other towns called the Schmalkaldic League. Charles had never been able to enforce the Edict of Worms, and in 1530, after a meeting of uh, princes of the Holy Ro Roman Empire in Augsburg, Germany, uh, they attempted to unify Christianity in light of the fact that the, I know you won't believe this, the Muslims were getting ready to invade Europe once again. And so they wanted to unify everybody because of this threat of an Islamic invasion. And so there was an uneasy peace that developed. But fearing that Charles might use military force at this time to finally enforce the Edict of Worms, Luther wrote a pamphlet called A Warning to His Dear German People, which was published in 1531. And it had three parts. The Magdeburg Confession was modeled after Luther's warning, and it also contained three parts. So, 1531, the Schmalkaldic League is formed by Prince Philip of Hesse and Prince John Frederick I of Saxony, the two most powerful Protestant rulers at the time, and their whole thing is to protect the Protestants. Luther died 15 years later in 1546. Now, Charles did not move quickly. He waited three years, and then he imposed a law called the Augsburg Interim, which demanded several things. First of all, Lutherans were to restore the number of sacraments. Luther, Lutherans had reduced the seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church to two, baptism and the Lord's table. But they were going to have to restore all seven. The churches had to restore a number of the Roman Catholic ceremonies, doctrines, and practices. And the decree also called for these churches to reject completely the doctrine of justification by faith alone and required them to uh, 
uh, accept the authority of the Pope as the head of the church and to again receive the authority of the Roman bishop. So in concession to the Lutherans, they had a number of things that they went along with, but what happened is that uh, and this is part of it. Four months after Luther's death, Charles V entered into a treaty, and he said his imperial majesty should prepare himself a war against those who objected to the Council of Trent, against the Schmalkaldic League, and against all who were addicted to the false belief and error in Germany. How would you like to have lived in Germany as a Protestant at this time? Talk about chaos. Talk about uncertainty. So that's basically he's declaring war against the Schmalkaldic League, and they're defeated in battle. Uh, Philip of Hesse, John Frederick of Hesse are imprisoned, and it looks like it's all over with. So all of the towns start to uh, go along with the Augsburg uh, interim, to, and that this would end the Protestant Reformation. The only city to stand against the emperor was Magdeburg. And so they put together this um, document. It's called the Magdeburg Confession and states that when a higher or superior authority makes an unjust or immoral law or decrees, the lower or lesser authority in government has the right, even the duty in the sight of God to interpose against the, that immoral law or decree to refuse obedience to the immoral law or decree and if need be, to openly resist the unjust or immoral law or decree made by the higher authority. And they stated that the idea of unlimited obedience to the state is an invention of the devil. When the state makes laws commanding us to do that which God forbids or makes law forbidding us to do that which God commands, we obey God rather than the state. Sounds biblical, doesn't it? They've really thought it through. Whether a Christian magistrate can, can or ought to preserve his state and the Christian teachers and hearers in it against his own superior magistrate and drive off by force one who is using force to compel people to reject the true doctrine and the worship of God to accept idolatry. And they have a warning that even good men are sometimes carnally impatient of injuries and can badly abuse opinions that have been rightly handed down to them. So we recognize police officers, governors, everybody has a sin nature. They can do, do wrong things. So we have to be on guard here. So I'm going to skip over some of this. And I'm, they didn't invent this. They didn't, they didn't come up with this on their own. It had been part of Christianity for hundreds of years. Thomas Aquinas, in his classic work on the Summa Theologica, which is a sum of theology, which was a classic, impressive work, writes in uh, Volume 2, Part 2, Question 42, the same thing. I'll go over this next time. But he says the same thing, that you, this, the Christian has the right to resist a tyrant. That there can be, look at that last line, therefore there can be sedition without mortal sin. And this he sets forth, but it didn't start with him, look. He quotes Augustine from De Civitate Dei, the city of God, in uh, 2.21. The same argument, it's just war argument. There were a number of others, for example, John of Salisbury, who was one of the founders of Oxford in the 12th century, articulates the same thing. So this is a foundation. What's the question we're trying to answer? Was the American War for Independence a rebellion or a war for independence? Understanding just war theory is what's critical to be able to answer that, and so next time we're going to come back and talk about that because what we hear today, I got out on the internet and did a lot of searches, and there's so many people who were saying that Antifa and Black Lives Matter, and they're comparing them to the patriots at Bunker Hill, in Massachusetts, at Valley Forge, and this is the same kind of thing that was done. And so we're asking very objectively, is it the same kind of thing that was done, or is there a difference? 
And as we always say, we have to go back to the Bible and understand what the Bible teaches and how the people in 1776 understood the Bible and were they right. So we'll continue this next time. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things, to understand our history a little better, understand the development of ideas a little better, and to understand the truth of Scripture that we are to submit to your authority, we are to submit to the authorities that you've set over us, whether it's in the family, in school, at work, or in relation to government. That we are to be an example. We are to be a light. We are to be a demonstration of humility and even when we are if necessary disobedient we must do so with respect father we know we don't always do a good job of that we have a sin nature but that's the focal point we need to be grace oriented just as you were grace oriented always you extend grace to your enemies and we are to follow that example we pray this in christ's name Amen.